Well, amen. You are here. That means you set your clocks forward or your phone just did it automatically for you, all right? Uh, But you're not going to fall asleep. You're going to hang with me the entire time, right? We have so much to rejoice, so much to celebrate. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Guys, we're going to continue our walk through our sermon series, Every Spiritual Blessing, that you and I in Christ Jesus have every spiritual blessing as it overflows unto us. While you're turning there, Baseball Hall of Famer Ted Williams is easily considered one of the greatest hitters of all time, a 19-time All-Star, a six-time batting champ. He ended his career with the highest career batting average of all time at 344. Now, sadly, his body is now in Scottsdale, Arizona, suspended in liquid nitrogen, awaiting the technology to piece him back together. The family signed a pact, him, his wife, and a son, and in it it read that one day they hoped that they would be able to be together again. It's sad because everything that our hearts long for is already found in Christ Jesus. That we have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Guys, as we've been walking through this sermon series, we have realized that our identity is found in Christ, that He has chosen us from the foundation of the world, that we are adopted as sons and daughters, and that He has redeemed us, purchased us, paid the ransom price, and freed us from slavery. And then last time we looked at the the fact that the Scripture talked about that all of history is moving towards one single point, and that is that all things will be subject and, and come to the culmination at the feet of Christ. And we looked at how... Uh, how in that spiritual blessing, you and I, we find purpose, that everything we do in this life can be for His kingdom. Now listen, this fifth one, this every spiritual blessing, also with a focus towards the future, is the fact that you and I have obtained an inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance that awaits us on that day. It's going to be magnificent. I can't wait to jump into it. All right, so listen as I read Ephesians chapter 1. I'll start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. All right, and then 4 through 10 is what I just recapped, that He has chosen us, that He's adopted us, that we are redeemed. And then that he has revealed the mystery, the summing up of all things in Christ. And that is our purpose. And with that view towards the future, listen to verses 11 and 12. In him, we also have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will. To the end, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and your word right now in the name of Jesus, God, longing to hear from you, longing to have your Holy Spirit teach us in an incredibly profound way to look forward to our inheritance in you. Father, we do pause to confess how little we number our days, how little we think about our eternal inheritance. Help us right now through the power of your Spirit to have your vision, to have your understanding that every single one of us can store up treasures in heaven and live for eternity. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Garrett and Karen are pulling this tape across with the idea so that you have this simple image in your mind. This tape represents the timeline of eternity. Now, in actuality, eternity wraps around this room time and time and time again. But with this visual in mind, I want you to comprehend this simple truth. That is, that your life is but the width of my pinky. Your 70 years, this is all it amounts to. In light of eternity, why would we ever prioritize living right here and right now? For it is but a second in all of eternity. But a second. You see, Christians have the perspective that is so much different from this world. Now listen, I'm not trying to be a downer this morning, all right? I'm not trying to say forget this life. It has no meaning. Uh, no, the exact opposite. Your life has incredible meaning. Remember all of last sermon. Your life has purpose. We live with kingdom purpose. But that purpose is found in Christ's story, not in your own that you and I have eternal weight and value. Now, Paul, in working through every spiritual blessing, as we have our focus towards eternity, towards all things moving to the feet of Christ, you and I realize, God says, I want you to understand, you have an eternal inheritance that awaits you your fifth every spiritual blessing, an eternal inheritance that you and I are called to dream. We are called to look forward to the feet of Christ, having lasting riches, eternal rewards that will never fade, that your best life is there. It's there. And that our best life now is nothing but a candle in comparison to the sun, to what awaits us. Christians have this perspective. I want you to think with me real quick about the insanity of the pyramids in Egypt. Has there, has there, is there anyone here who's ever traveled and seen the pyramids in person? Quite a few of you, a handful of you. I, it's magnificent, right? I would, I would love to go and to travel and to see them, how, how awesome they are, how huge, what an incredible feat. But I want you to pause and think about it from God's perspective, God's eye view, looking down at the pyramids. The tallest one of them is almost 500 feet tall. 2.3 million blocks, not bricks, blocks make up it. Millions of slaves put together to uh, work it out. How many different deaths involved in building each pyramid? How many man hours? So that one man can have a ginormous tomb and hope to stock up all of the world's riches inside, all in hopes that he could take it with him. It's absurd. It is absolutely absurd trying to hold on to that which you can't. Listen to me. God pressed me very hard this week about where we are, that God wants to give us an inheritance. He wants to place inside of our hand the truth of that which is waiting for us in Christ Jesus. He wants you to see it. He wants you to be like a kid who can't sleep on Christmas Eve. But so many of us, our hands are closed because we're clinging to the riches of this world. We're holding on to that which we cannot ultimately hold on to. And God wants to fill you. God wants you to overflow in such an incredible way, and yet your hand is closed. And so I want this to be the image. I want you to have this 
impressed into your mind that with all that God has given to you, he calls you to be open-handed. He calls you to be open-handed, not a clenched fist. Listen, I know that there's a difficult balance in life that yes, we are called to make money. Yes, we are called to work hard. Yes, you are called to save and buy beautiful land in the hill country and pass it down to your kids. Yes, yes, yes. But it cannot steal the affection of your heart. You can't take it with you. You can't. No matter how hard you try, So do not hold on to that which you cannot hold on to. Rather, you and I are called to take all the possessions of the world and have an open hand and say, God, you use them however you would like. Yes, God, you have blessed me, but they are all yours. I'm just a steward. And when our hands are open... If your hands are open this morning in your heart, listen, this fifth, every spiritual blessing, God wants to overflow in you all that awaits you. God, teach us to number our days. Now, secondly, before we jump into what it means to have an inheritance, before I define it and we take a closer look at it, Randy Alcorn, in his book, Heaven, he makes the assertion that I agree with and I want to propose to you, and that is that pastors don't preach often enough about the joys of heaven. And therefore, the people of God aren't compelled by what awaits them. In the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Huck asks Miss Watson what heaven will be like, to which she replies, that it'll be like one long, never-ending church service. Playing a harp and singing songs. Now, that would be torture to Huck. And frankly, he wants no part. He would rather have an adventure with his friend Tom Sawyer, no matter, even if he called the place hell. But guys, Paul explodes with a different tone about heaven. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Adventure, purpose, art, invention, you and I having authority, the earth made new, our bodies made new, physical, an actual reality, not floating on clouds playing harps. So guys, let's think about this and let's dive in. Let's define what awaits you and I in our every spiritual blessing that we have obtained an inheritance. First, more than any other thing you need to understand about our inheritance is that it is first and foremost ultimately about the restoration of your relationship with God. That is ultimately what it's about, your relationship with God. When Jesus in John 14 says, for I go to prepare a place for you. The King James Version says, I I go to prepare a mansion for you. A text that you and I most often begin to think about, what is it going to be like? There's going to be streets of gold and on and on. Listen, listen to what he says. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Did you know he's using marriage language there? The language and description of what Jesus is talking about in John 14 is that in the ancient world, you would propose to a bride and then you would go back to your father's land. You would build on a second home because there wasn't additional land to buy. You would build on a second home and then I would go and prepare a place for you and then I will come back to get you. He's using marriage language there and the whole emphasis is that where I am, you will be also. 
Guys, this theme becomes the climactic theme of the Bible that ultimately culminates in Revelation 19 in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Behold, we will be there and we will be with the Lamb of God and we will be his bride and there will be a giant banquet. So before you and I imagine in our inheritance anything about mansions or streets of gold, we we must set our hearts aright by remembering that God himself is the prize. Bro, what, what would you think of a bride who, whose first dream about marriage was, what's our home going to be like? Or what kind of neighborhood are, are we going to live in? Or, or what hobbies will I busy myself with during the day? You would say, no, 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 no. All of those things are secondary in light of who you are marrying, in light of the union of being with your beloved Church, the greatest romance that this world has ever seen, the fiercest delight that any parent has ever had in a child will be nothing but a drop in the ocean for when you see him face to face. Revelation 21, 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. If this is not your hope, if this is not your ultimate delight, I scarce call you a Christian. The summer between my junior and senior year uh, at A&M, that summer, I went on a mission trip, an engineering mission trip to India and spent three months there. Now, God stretched me mightily, and I loved being able to see the other side of the world, different cultures, different foods. I fell off a mountain But by the time my time was ending, I was homesick. I had this aching, this longing to come home. Now, you see, whenever I say or declare that I was homesick, more than anything, I mean I was homesick for a person. See, my future wife was on the other side of the world, and communication was scarce. It was back in the time when uh, only once every two or three days I had to go down to an internet cafe to check my email. Only twice during that entire three months was I able to save up enough money just to make a phone call to call back to hear her voice. Still 20 years later, it is vividly burned into my memory that reunion at the airport. I remember exactly what she was wearing. The smile on her face, the look in her eyes. My beloved. Guys, Jesus is your beloved. Do you say with the psalmist, My soul waits for the Lord. It waits for the Lord, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord as the watchman waits for the morning, as the watchman waits for the morning. What will it be like for you to behold your Savior, the King of kings and Lord of lords? Do me a favor. Close your eyes. Don't go to sleep. Close your eyes. You will soon die. Your days here are numbered. And you will be before 
Jesus and his throne. Everything else will fade away, and you will be before him, surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to sing it all? I can only imagine. You can open your eyes. Now, there's certainly more to our inheritance, but he is always ultimate. He is always first. Everything else pales in comparison and is secondary to him. Secondly, believer, your inheritance includes the restoration of all things being made new. No more death, no more pain, no more effects of sin. It's important to remember that the earth will be made new. So this means walking and talking and eating and skiing and football and soccer and probably not baseball. Maybe in eternity it won't feel so slow. The earth is going to be a physical reality made new. You and I will have earthly bodies. Look around and imagine what will this place be like if there is no more decay, if there is no more death. No horrors of the nightly news where thieves don't break in and steal, where your enemy does not prowl around like a roaring lion. And Christ is ruling and reigning in his final reign. Revelation 21, verse 4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. No more pain because Jesus has wiped away every hurt. All relationships restored, no longer haunted by pride and hurt. Adam, no longer being a coward and playing the blame game, always blaming someone else. What is it going to be like when all of our relationships are healed? No more sickness. All of these from broken, fragile bodies, COVID, the Spanish flu, polio, smallpox, AIDS. Four months ago, I broke my ankle doing something stupid, not remembering that I'm not 20 anymore. And every morning when I wake up and every time when I step on uneven surface, she cries out to me. And you say, oh, young pup. <laughs> I've got a knee that tells me it'll rain in three weeks, so don't talk to me about aches and pains. Aches and pains? I've had aches and pains since 1983. <laughs> and it's all half-hearted joking until we talk about what cancer and Alzheimer's the way that it's ravaged your loved ones. What will it be like when death is no more? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? What will it be like 
to see them again. To hug them. To hear their voice. To know with certainty that they're doing okay. And to see their smile and to laugh. When death is swallowed up in victory. And just in case you're worried that in eternity you will mess up the whole thing. Like if anyone's going to mess it up, you're going to mess it up because of your sinful heart. Just in case you're worried about that, 1 John 3, 2 says that when he comes, we will be like him. We will be fixed. We will finally have a heart that can keep fixed for all of eternity, no longer wandering away from our God, no longer prone to wander. Guys, when I was young, my mom told me that Jesus would come back in my lifetime. Hey, can I just confess? Can I just be honest with you? When I was, when I was young, that scared me. I hated that. I had so much life to live. I didn't want him to come back. I wanted, I wanted my life. Can I just tell you what he's done in my heart? That I've realized he is life. Amen. And I ache, I long for my home. Finally, your inheritance includes each of us receiving our own rewards in heaven. Christians rewarded for our good deeds. Most believers are not aware of the fact that the Bible teaches that there are two judgments. The first of which is the great white throne of judgment in, in which the Lamb's book of life will be opened and those who are saved will go into eternity and those who are not saved will be judged for their deeds and will go into the lake of fire. That's the first judgment. But there is a second judgment that every Christian endures. It's called the judgment of the throne of Christ. And it is there that every man's deeds will be tested by fire, and you will be rewarded for that which you've stored up in heaven. Listen, as Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which, which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as though through fire. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Right. Look at that verse. It says quite clearly that you and I will suffer a loss for squandering opportunities, realizing we could have stored up treasure in heaven. We could have done that good deed with proper motives, with faith. We could have done so, but when that work gets tested by fire in eternity, it's burned up. You need to understand that loss won't be an eternal loss. It will be temporary. He will wipe away that tear from your eye. And heaven will be filled with the rejoicing of those who served and sacrificed for Jesus. The good news is you won't be jealous of others and their rewards, your heart will be fixed and you will be able to look at them and realize their sacrifice and what they stored up in heaven and you will rejoice with them because it exalts Christ. And every one of us will receive for our good and righteous deeds a jewel that will go in our crown. And then as Revelation 4.10 says, we will cast our crowns at the feet of Christ. Live for eternity. 
Store up treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you realize that when I was in India, I did not buy any furniture, nor did I hang any art on the wall? Why? Well, see, I was just passing through. Wouldn't make much sense, would it? Did you also know that you and I will be given dominion, authority, responsibility in the new heaven and in the new earth? We, in heaven, we, we will not just be spectators. We will not just be audience sitting on the sideline. We will not get a Super Bowl ring while we sat on the sideline. Didn't do anything. No, that's not the picture. Rather, we will reign in proportion to how much we invest in heaven. Matthew 25 describes this. The one who had received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gathered five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for King Xerxes. And according to the world standards, he had achieved everything that's desirable. He had riches, and even though he was a foreigner, he had risen to a prominent, prominent position in the palace. But he's an incredible example of one who held on to all of his earthly possessions open-handed because God would call him to let go of all of that and to go back to Jerusalem and to lead them in rebuilding the wall. Nehemiah risked his life by going and standing before the king and making this plea. Furthermore, he left his position in the palace and he moved his wife and his family to Jerusalem, to an area that is uh, unsafe and unprotected and filled with all sorts of danger. He mobilized a dejected people to rebuild the wall amidst fierce opposition and even a daily threat of death. As a leader, Nehemiah did not lead at an arm's length away, but rather he entered into their poverty. He called a town hall together by which he pleaded with the people, why are you charging interest? Don't you understand that the poor cannot handle the interest you're charging? They all agreed to do away with it. And then furthermore, they agreed to give land back to the original landowners because the poor needed that. Nehemiah rose up and became governor, and yet he refused to even take the taxes that were owed to him for his own personal support. He lived off of his previous wealth. Now, do you think that would cause him to be stingy? The complete opposite. He was still incredibly generous, hosting banquets where 150 people would come to his place, and he would supply all of the food so that he could boost morale. Having done all of that, there's a climactic statement that he makes in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 19, where he simply says this, remember me, O oh my God, for all the good that I have done for your people. He's storing up treasures in heaven. He's open-handed with all that God has given him. And he simply says, remember me on that day. Guys, we have the honor and privilege of taking the Lord's Supper this morning. I want you to go ahead and grab those elements, and I want you to mentally begin to transfer in your mind that we get to take the Lord's Supper. Here at First Baptist, Bernie if you are a born-again, baptized believer, you are invited to take the Lord's Supper with us. If you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, the truth of the matter is, is this is just bread and grape juice. It means nothing to you. 
But to those of us that are being saved, it is everything to us. I want you to think with me, there's an incredible passage in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus is giving a reminder. He tells a parable of a servant that is ready for his master's return. You see, the master had gone away to a wedding banquet. And it would be days, maybe even weeks, before the master had returned. And so there's a temptation for uh, the servant to not be ready, to get lazy, to slack off, to not do his chores, to not be prepared when the master comes home. But in the parable that Jesus tells, the servant is ready. He is looking down the road. He is longing for his master's return, no matter day or night. And as he sees the master approaching, he opens the door and greets him. Now catch this, because in Luke 12, verse 37, after the servant has opened the door for his master, something incredible happens. Maybe you've never caught this in the text, but it says the master is so overjoyed by the servant that the master sits the servant down and tells him, recline at the table. And then the master girds himself as a servant and serves his servant. Guys, that is a picture of our inheritance in heaven. That is a picture of our humble, gracious, generous, grace-giving, overflowing God. That when you and I get to eternity, and hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. He is going to call us to recline at the table, and then he will serve us. And then he will serve us. What will all of eternity be like when our God when our Savior is continuing to stoop down and serve us, it's too magnificent. I can't comprehend what awaits us in our inheritance. So let's take this Lord's Supper together. Go ahead and peel back the first element. And I want you to hold the bread. As we take the bread, you need to always remember that this is a remembrance of Jesus' broken body of his servanthood, of his humility, that he was broken for your sin. And Scripture warns us, never take this lightly, but that you and I are supposed to confess our sin and remember what he's done for us. So right there in the quietness of your seat or at home, just pause to confess and remember his broken body. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I 
Now take a moment and begin to open the cup. That evening in, in Luke 22, Luke tells us that that evening when Jesus entered the room, he looked at his disciples and said, I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting to give you this gift. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of our eternal inheritance. That there is a day when Jesus will eat and drink with us in eternity. And he says he is waiting, that he is not partaking of this celebration until we get there. He's waiting for his bride to come. The Lord's Supper constantly points us forward. Not only does it point us back to the cross, but it points us forward to what awaits us. And so here in just a moment, we are going to drink this together as a family, but it's a sign of our eternal inheritance. It's a sign of our victory and what, what Christ has done for us. And so there in the quietness of your seat or at home, I want you to think for just a moment about the victory that has been given to you that his blood washes sin. He doesn't leave you where you are. In the same way, he took the cup. Now, after they had eaten, he says, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for who you are and for all that you've done. Whenever we were your enemies, whenever we were far away, you came and you died for us. And Father, we confess that so often we are clinging and holding on to things that we cannot hold on to. But in your goodness, in your kindness, our inheritance still awaits. You still call us forward. You still lift our heads and you point our eyes to the culmination of all things at the feet of Christ. Teach us to live for eternity. Forgive us whenever we hold on to things that which we cannot hold on to. Discipline us, Father. Allow us to see reality as it is. Teach us to number our days. Remind every believer here that they can store up treasures in heaven. We love you. We pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.